And now it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsi. Yo, Lord willing, Jeff Canarsi, Mob Talk Radio, check it out. Yo, we stay quiet, like Russell Buffalino, when things will get ugly like Pessy's death in Casino. Who do we know? No one, nobody. But we're all well respected like Della Croce and Gotti. I know wild nights, a fan of not turn. Light up a cigar and watch the spot burn. You'll get patty whacked, I'm tough like Irish dock workers. Rubber guys, rubber guys, hooligans and black lurkers. Corner berserkers, street savvy soldiers. You owe, you better pay. Don't make me say I told you. Cold you don't portray, I say what I mean. Providence and Brooklyn all the way to the bean. I'd rather be unseen, like Benny the Chin. I don't gotta go to Vegas to see cities of sin. Pull the pin, drop bombs like Danny Green I write homicide like the murder machine Lansky Luciano, mastermind the racket Up in the clam house with a million in my jacket And welcome to Mob Talk Radio I am your host Jeff Canarsi And we have a big one today uh, If you notice a little uh, pause there uh, There's something that happened just prior to me doing this That infuriates me In a way that I'm going to try to compose myself. I normally don't hold back on this show. But in this case I have to. Because I know that my reaction. To the shit that I just saw. uh, Could literally drive me to the point of getting in a car. And going to this prick's house. And bashing his fucking head in. That's how much I dislike this motherfucker. I'm not going to do anything at this point like that. I'm just simply venting. So for those that are going to run off saying I'm levying a threat or whatever, it, it's not the case. I'm very frustrated by what I just saw. Uh, on today's show, though, however, I will get to what I was angry at in about 10 seconds. Uh, we are going to talk about Lucky Luciano, uh, massive Q&A, uh, and sort of everything in between. Uh, so what am I angry at? Well, <laughs> let, let me just say it this way. I'm not even going to mention no names. I, I think anybody that knows me or follows my show uh, can pretty much figure this out. If you're going to stalk people, if you're going to fucking report garbage, all right, fine. Just when I thought, just when I thought we couldn't reach the fucking bottom of the barrel for anything more sc- fucking scumbag jerk offish. We have. First of all, I don't give a fuck whose opinion is the boss of this, the boss of that. I, that's, not, I, that's not even up for debate. I don't give a shit about any of that. Anybody that's a moron is going to repeat names because they don't fucking know what's going on. And that's the truth. If they knew, they wouldn't name a different guy every other week as the boss of a crime family, right? But something that I saw today. And I'm sort of going to tell a story. And the reason why I'm going to tell you a story is because it's going to branch exactly what I'm fucking talking about. All right. So uh, back in, I want to say probably 90, 2004, 3, 2, 1, 97, 98. All right. My father would di- was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Uh, They gave him five years to live, five years to the day that they diagnosed him, he died. Uh, That is true. Uh, But something very interesting happened. Uh, I was a very private guy. I always felt like that my inner circle was five or ten people. I had a lot of associations with a lot of people, but my inner circle was like ten, ten people. You know, the girlfriends came out, the wives came out, whatever the case may be. Uh, But one of my friend's uh, girlfriends at the time, took it upon herself to pick up the phone while I was in Rhode Island. Uh, and then I came back to where I was res- residing at the time. Got on the phone and said, did you hear the news? Jeff's dad's got cancer. Now, first of all, I didn't know this girl like that. She was not a part of my inner circle. She was dating somebody that was in my circle. Now, it's true. You know, you give respect to people that are dating people. But I always had one kind of rule. And this makes me an asshole, I'm sure, on, on some kind of fucking level. But I always told people, my personal business is my personal business. You don't put that out for nobody. And it would have been different if my friend had called a couple people and said, look, his father's got cancer, you know, stop don't don't fuck with him for the next two weeks. Let this sink in for him. He needs space. That would be one thing. 
That would be one thing. But while I'm in Rhode Island, my phone starts blowing up. The fucking Facebook starts blowing. Well, it wasn't Facebook. I think it was uh, America Online. Maybe it was. I can't remember. This was back in the 90s that he that he first was diagnosed. So it would have been right before. It would have been like AOL, uh, America Online. And so people are like messaging me. I'm so sorry. This, that, the third. And, and there are people that were messaging me were friends. But they weren't people that I would have called and said, hey, my father's, you know, got cancer. You know, I'm scared. You know, what am I going to do? And so the end result is this. I blew my fucking top. I was so fucking angry. I was getting ready to come back to Rhode Island. I was going to just fucking go off on this girl. She had no fucking right. Did you hear the news? Jeff's dad got cancer. It's not her place to do that. And it enraged me like you got no idea because to me it came off like she was reporting gossip. It was true, but that should have been something that I talked to people about. And so when I got back, I arranged a dinner. I brought all my people there, and she walks in, and my buddy's looking at me because, you know, he knows I'm going to rail his girlfriend. I'm going to say something to her, and it's not going to be fucking pretty, but he's not going to say anything back to me because I sort of had this thing where, People, I'm not going to say were afraid of me, but depending on my mood, they weren't going to push. Uh, if I was angry or agitated, they just, they wouldn't say nothing and they'd wait till I calmed down or I was in a better mood. People used to take my temperature all the time. I was a very angry young man. I, I don't think there's any way around that. Uh, I still am an angry guy, but not like I was then. Now I'm a little more calculated in what I do. So anyway, the long long end of it is, is she sits there, I look at her, and I'm like, listen, you fucking bitch. You ever open up your fucking mouth about my family again, I'm going to crack you. I would never in a million years ever hurt a woman anyway. That's not my thing. But I was so enraged that I took a beer and threw it in her face. Okay, That was not a cool thing to do. uh, But I was so fucking physically enraged that somebody breached what I considered to be... uh, my personal business my buddy didn't say a word he stood up he gave her a napkin and walked her out to the car and they left and that was it uh i you know i look back on those things and and i i'm angry at myself because i shouldn't have behaved that way uh but i was so enraged and and i think a lot of it was you know i was scared my father was going to die i didn't know what to do with myself i had some some things with my ex-girlfriend blah 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 but the long end of it and this is the, the long end of it is is that people shouldn't put your business out there That's why I get so angry when people talk about my friends. Like, shut the fuck up already. And that's what sort of leads me to what I'm about to say. If someone is sick, anybody, cancer, the flu, well, not the flu, but cancer, uh, car accident, coma, what gives you the right as a journalist to put that out? What gives you the fucking right to report that? And when you report that, you're reporting it is to give leverage to somebody's name you want to put at the head of the mafia or whatever the fuck the case may be. Because that's what, exactly what this fucking asshole did today or the other day. And I'm so fucking enraged. And it reminded me of the story from my past. Uh, you know what? If you want to talk about a guy, talk about a guy. But you got no right going on social media telling people somebody's sick. The fuck is wrong with you? You jerk off piece of shit fuck. You are a fucking, just when I thought you could not become a fucking scumbag anymore, you proved me fucking wrong. You lie about everybody. You got caught lying about people last week. And now you're doing this shit. What the fuck is wrong with you? You have any fucking morals, you jerk off fuck? There are things you just don't do. There are things you don't do. And he did it. Because he's a fucking piece of shit. And people keep saying to me, oh, why do you hate this person, that person? This is why I hate people. It's one thing if you want to fucking put somebody in a murder, which is bullshit because he does this. You want to call somebody a rat, which he did, which wasn't the fucking truth. And he got busted lying about that bullshit. But now he wants to put it out that somebody is sick. Got cancer, whatever the fuck. And I'm not mentioning either name. Because I refuse to mention that cocksucker's name ever again. I'm not going to give him. He, he deserves no respect because he doesn't know how to give it. But what he said I found to be fucking so repulsive, so fucking disgusting, that I would love to slap him in his fucking mouth. I would love to slap that piece of shit. But I'm not going to. 
I'm not going to go near the guy. I'm not even going to associate with the guy, talk to the guy, or even mention that motherfucker's name ever again. That's the type of shit that pisses me off. And you people can sit there and go, oh, here he goes again on his fucking rant. He doesn't like somebody. How would you feel? Your father, your mother was sick. And some asshole put it on social media as if it's fucking newsworthy. As if it means anything. It's fucking revolting. And I'm sick and fucking tired of it. It ain't, listen, the mob shit, throw that to the side for a minute. At what fucking point do you look at yourself in the mirror and say, yeah, I'm a respectable guy. You're a piece of shit vulture fuck. You're a crumb, you're a pigeon, and a jerk off, and a fucking rat, and an FBI lover, and an informant fucker. You name it, that's what you fucking are, you jerk off. And whoever they were talking about doesn't matter. I don't even know the person they were talking about. I know of them. But I think that there's a fine line where you just kind of got to keep it together and you don't say certain shit. This motherfucker, I, he just, I don't think, I, either he's fucking retarded, uh, he's drunk all the time. I don't know what his problem is, but he says this shit and like there's nothing, there's no like fucking barrier in his fucking stupid deluded brain that says to him, you know what, maybe I shouldn't say this. Maybe this is wrong. How's that going to affect his kids, his wife, his family, his friends? Why is that fucking news? What does it have to do with anything? You fucking vulture. So listen, I apologize, but that shit, that really bothers me. Even my enemies on fucking, or my haters on fucking social media, even my haters, the ones that just continuously poke and prod and start shit because they're fucking lunatics. If I found out one of their family members was sick or they were sick, you know what I would do? Because of who I am, I would reach out and say, how you doing? Are you all right? Do you need anything? I wouldn't announce it like it was a fucking carnival act. Now coming to the three ring circus, someone who has cancer. I- at what point does this guy have any morals? It just fucking sickens me, and I'm fucking tired of it. Say what you want about Joey Donuts, uh, Philly the fucking wrench, and all of these little mob nicknames and all this other bullshit that people report. Take that aside for a second. Put push that to the left. I could be angry about that. I could be raw. I could be angry about the assertions that he makes about people that I may or may not know. And I can defend them because they don't deserve it. But when you go that far and you step over the fucking line, it's one thing to peek over somebody's fence. It's one thing to fucking stalk them in the bushes, jerking each other off while you film a guy getting arrested. It's another to make false accusations about people that could get them fucking killed. Now you're going to say some shit about somebody being sick. You fucking piece of shit. He's a fucking scumbag, he's a dog, and he's a just an utter piece of shit on every fucking level. No tact, no fucking balls, no fucking morals. He's a coward, he's a bitch, and a punk. All right, that's it. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. So for anybody that wants to try to manipulate what I'm saying here and saying, oh, he's levying threats, I'm not levying threats at anybody. I'm highly pissed off that he was so fucking insensitive, so arrogant, and so much full of himself that he can't just shut the fuck up and stop saying stupid shit like this. You fucking scumbag. I ain't love you threaded anybody. Do I want to smack him? Sure, who doesn't want to smack him? I got a thousand, I got 10,000 people that would smack him if they could get away with it. That doesn't mean we do that. I'm venting my anger because that shit infuriated me. And I'm going to tell you something that I don't talk about. My sister died of cancer at age 10, okay? My father died of cancer at 61 years old. When people fucking talk about that shit like it's news and gossip, it infuriates me with a rage you have no idea. You have no idea. I wonder if that piece of shit pricks ever buried a fucking 10-year-old kid. With cancer. You ever done that, you fuck? No. You ever watch your father die, be withered down to 70 pounds, dying in a bed? Refusing to die because he's worried about what's going to happen to his son? 
So when people fucking say shit like that, I, it opens up a fucking part of me that I'm not comfortable with. Because I get violent and angry. I'm not fucking crazy. I, I just, I have feelings like other fucking people. And I will not tolerate this shit from anybody. So listen to the motherfucking prick if you want to do that. But at some point, you got to see what everybody else sees. I could give a shit less what the fuck this guy does with the rest of his fucking life. Because the minute he said that shit on Instagram, he became persona non grata and a big, the biggest piece of shit I've ever seen in my fucking life. Scumbag fuck. Alright, so all that being said, I'm going to take a break before I have a fucking aneurysm on this motherfucker. And when we come back, we're going to talk about Stephen Crea Jr.'s plea deal for a second. And then we're going to get into the Q&A and get into Lucky Luciano. Like I said, I apologize. I just, I'm passionate about things, you know. But when you go that to that point, when you go to that point, I lose my shit. We'll be right back on Mob Talk Radio. On a given week, I'm out of town a lot. Uh, whether it's Philadelphia, it's New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, wherever the case may be, I'm always looking for a place where I can sit down and have a great dinner. Uh, ambiance is key. Price is obviously key. But the most important thing is, is the food good? And there's a place I want to tell you about today. It's called Saltwater at Margate. Uh, if you are going down to the shore, because I know a lot of people in Philadelphia go to the shore, uh, especially Margate, you're missing out on a great restaurant if you haven't been there. Uh, the name is Saltwater Margate. It's at 9401 Ventnor Avenue, Margate City, New Jersey. Uh, the phone number there is 609-289-8078. You can also visit them online at saltwatermargate.com. This place is unbelievable. Not only is the food absolutely superb, the price is great too. Uh, they're renowned for their pizza and their gnocchi. Uh, they have all kinds of different things from mussels to roast pork and Italian fare. So do yourself a favor. Do me a favor. Go and visit Saltwater Margate. You will not be disappointed. Uh, it is a place that I think at some point, if not already, there's going to be lines out the door and around the block. So if you're down on the shore, stop in, go to Saltwater Margate. At least check them out online at saltwatermargate.com. And welcome back to Mop Talk Radio. Uh, okay, as far as Stephen Crea Jr. goes, uh, Stephen Crea is an alleged capo in the Lucchese crime family. Uh, he's pretty much going to accept a plea deal uh, expected to be entered this week into the courts. It includes charges of racketeering uh, and other assorted crimes. Uh, but he is not going to plead guilty to the murder of uh, former Purple Gang leader Michael Meldish. Uh, and that's just the way that rolls. Uh, Korea probably realistically is going to be looking at a 13 year sentence as reported by Jerry Capisci. That's uh, from him. Uh, but but Korea from the very beginning has maintained his innocence uh, from day one. He even took a a polygraph, which, you know, a polygraph isn't admitted in, into court, can't be admitted, but he actually passed a polygraph, uh, you know, saying that he had nothing to do with that crime whatsoever. There's a ton of fucking informants in this case, and I, I don't want to get into the whole specifics of it, but uh, all that being said, uh, Creo was offered a 10-year plea agreement earlier, uh, but it included the murder of Michael Meldish, and he just absolutely is uh, basically saying he didn't fucking do it. He's not going to accept any deal that includes a murder that he didn't participate in. Uh, so it's expected that he's going to get handed a 13-year sentence. Uh, the Crea was indicted with his father, Stephen Crea Sr., and Maddie Madonna uh, for murder and racketeering and a slew of other charges. And we have a bunch of questions sort of revolving around this today, so I'm going to try to answer them. Uh, on the show, more than anything, uh, there are certain aspects to the Maddie Madonna and Stephen Crea case that I can't get into for a couple different reasons, and I'll explain why once we get to those questions. Uh, so all that being said, we're going to jump right in and get to the Q&A. Uh, once again, if I didn't get to your question, it's because time just doesn't allow for it. You can submit your questions to me at, uh, on Twitter at RealMobTalk7. You can also check us out on Mob Talk Radio on Facebook. Uh, and we are on Instagram as well. Okay, I saw a photo recently of the late Frank Callity at a charity event, and I was wondering if there were other mob guys you know that were philanthropists. I don't know if I would exactly use that term 
a philanthropist for this. Uh, I think that there are guys that take care of the community. Tony Salerno, by all stretch of the imagination, did. There were a couple, uh, and we'll talk about a few of them here. Uh, but listen, a lot of these guys have been charitable in their lives, so we have to sort of wade through the deep end a little bit because I think we can honestly say that some people do this shit for charity because they genuinely care about people. I think others do it because it sort of, uh, you know, gives them the Robin Hood sort of mystique that they, they rob from the rich and give to the poor, et cetera, et cetera. But the people that I'm going to mention right now are not the Robin Hood people. They're, they're people that care about the community, care about people. Uh, and we're going to start with the first one, and that's being Joey Merlino. Uh, Joey Merlino, for years, fed the homeless, gave away Christmas presents to kids, brought in people to play Santa Claus and stuff. He's, he's always given back to people. Uh, Ray Patriarca gave a ton of money uh, to people and charities. He actually started... Uh, he actually, along with other people, helped start St. Jude's, which a lot of people don't know about. Uh, St. Jude's was actually started by Danny Thomas, uh, but it really, truly, the antithesis of St. Jude's, in part, uh, money came from mob people, and that's not in any way, shape, or form to try to say St. Jude's was started by mafia money, but people that were involved in organized crime donated money to other people. That money got put in and at the end of the day who gives a fuck if they're criminals it, it St. Jude's is a great place and it's done a lot of things for kids uh, and that's how really a lot of the money got uh, sort of together to to sort of make St. Jude's a lot of people don't know that uh, Frank Costello was very generous with people who needed money as well uh, but probably the, the biggest one is Tony Salerno uh, who consistently made sure that everybody in his neighborhood had money. If they didn't have food, he made sure they got it. If they needed money, they got it. If they needed a job, he'd get them a job. Uh, if they needed bills paid, he'd pay their bills. Uh, he just took care of uh, his community. So there are a lot of guys that do it. Uh, but I don't know if we would we, we should call that philanthropy uh, necessarily. But all right. Out of all the Philly rap books, uh, let's see. Which one was, okay, out of all the Philadelphia rap books, V.C., Leonetti, Previty, Caramondi, and Ralph Natale, which one, if any, are the most accurate? Ugh. All right, as far as books, I mean, look, there's always an element of truth to some, exp to some aspect. I mean, everything that you ever hear of, uh, be it the Loch Ness Monster and all this other crazy shit, uh, everything always has somewhat uh, a bit of truth to it. Now, how much the truth is is one thing. Uh, but the problem is, is th these guys all inflate who they were. Uh, they inflate what they did uh, and how often they did it. And, uh, informants are notorious for that. Uh, they are who they are. At some point, they're involved in organized crime. But it seems like all these guys from Previty uh, to VC uh, have all sort of made their life bigger. Uh, Ralph Natale really told some good ones. Uh, but these guys all inflate who they are. So you never really know, honestly, uh, what the total truth is. I mean, I wasn't there. Uh, but especially with the mention of those books in general, it, you know, it, it's just one of those things of one or two things may be true, but then there's 50 others that aren't. So how can you take a book in its whole? Uh, but if I have to rank them in believability, which I don't believe many of them, but based on certain facts that I do know, I would probably say that Caramande, then Leonetti, VC, Previty, and Ralph Natale. That's the way I would kind of do it. Uh, but the things I've heard about each of those guys would, would blow you away. Uh, they all, in many ways, sort of elevated themselves, like I said. Uh, they made more of a legacy about themselves than the actual truth itself. Uh, I can tell you that of all those guys, the one person who ratted, who did rat, which completely shocked a lot of people was Philip Leonetti. A lot of people thought that Phil Leonetti would never talk, but you know that was a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. But ultimately, at the end of the day, Phil, Philip Leonetti uh, has gone on record as saying things like he didn't like Joey Merlino. Uh, he didn't want to be near him. Joey Merlino was the downfall to the Philadelphia Mafia. But the truth is, uh, and you could take this as a fact because it is a fact, is that Philip Leonetti actually did like Joey Merlino a lot. He actually liked Joey. So when he goes on these shows and he starts saying all this crazy shit, he's got to mention Joey because, you know, he, he just, these it's, it's it's like the guys that uh, are rats and they go out and they have to, to mention John Gotti or any of these other people. They do it because that's notoriety for them. Uh, them just being themselves isn't big enough, so they have to pull another name into it. And that's essentially what Leonetti did on the 60-minute show by bringing up Joey and some other things like that. Um 
So when they get asked questions like that, they, they manipulate the truth. Uh, so, of course, you know, he's going to say things about other people. But the truth is, like I said earlier, he did like Joey. I mean, if we go on the principle uh, that he can't admit the very fact that he did like Joey, then how in the hell can we believe much of everything else that he says? Uh, he blamed his uncle Nick Scarfo for everything. Uh, but unlike other rats, uh, he didn't rat in the beginning to avoid charges. He waited till he got sentenced to 45 years before he starts telling on everybody. And, and he really impacted a lot of different people. Uh, so, you know, I, I think for me, it's hard to believe a lot of those books, uh, especially anything written by fucking, uh, you know, George Anastasia. I don't believe anything he writes because he's been on record as not telling the truth. So, uh it's entertainment. It's meant to be entertainment, so enjoy it as such. All right, out of all the boss's sons who got into the life at some point, who do you think was groomed the best, and who do you think uh, wasn't, and who should have never gotten involved? Oh, boy, you're obviously trying to get me in trouble with this one. Uh, I sort of feel like I'm being <laughs> baited a little bit here. Uh, I think Tommy Gambino was one of the best, along with Vito Rizzuto. Uh, and I think of all the sons, you know, I I don't think Tommy Gambino really wanted to, to be in that life, uh, but he just kind of did what his father wanted him to do. Uh, Santos Traficante Jr. was was really good at what he did. Uh, but as far as guys who shouldn't have gotten involved, there's a lot of names I could mention. Uh, Greg Scarpa is probably one that shouldn't. John Gotti Jr. probably shouldn't. Uh, but it, it just it is what it is, and that's not to disrespect anybody, but I just think that there are certain guys that are cut from a cloth uh, and certain guys that aren't. And I, I, I think especially when we see the case uh, recently with Vinny the Chin's son getting pinched, uh, you know, there's that famous scene in the Gotti movie where allegedly Genevieve says to Gotti, you know, it's it's a shame that, you know, Gotti's bragging about making his own son. And, and uh, Vinny the Chin just shakes his head like, how, how could any father want his son involved in this? Yet there's the hypocrisy right there. All right. Please talk about Pittsburgh and anything you have information on. Uh, it's a great, tough city that goes unspoken of in your world. Why is that? Uh, it's really unspoken because it's no longer a base. And what I mean by that is they, they essentially have been defunct for a long time. Uh, historically, though, that's a bit of a different story. Uh, historically, Pittsburgh was broken into really two factions. They had the Sicilian Mafia, and then the who really ran the north and south sides of the city. Then you had the Camorra, which is Neapolitan, uh, in the east end of the city. In the early 1920s, there were two fact the two factions basically went to war over bootlegging, drugs, and everything else. Once prohibition starts. Then the two factions really start to go after each other, uh, really specifically in the Italian neighborhoods of Larimer, Homewood, uh, the Hill District, and in downtown. And they also fought, fought over New Kensington, Arnold, uh, Wilkinsburg, uh, what else, McKees, Rocks, uh, Wilmington, and Braddock. Uh, from 1926 till about 1933, there were over 200 murders alone. So Phil uh, it's not Philadelphia, Pittsburgh was a hotbed for organized crime for a long time. Uh, Stefano uh, Montessero was really the first boss of Pittsburgh. There was also a contingent from Chicago and other French groups as well. Uh, Monastero would eventually get whacked in 1929, and then his brother would sort of take over, but then he was killed soon after. Uh, then Saragusa would take over, but he couldn't keep the power and would end up getting whacked in 1931, a few days after Salvatore Maranzano got killed, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, but after the hit on Saragusa, the family would would pretty much get a new boss in Sicilian tough guy, uh, John Bozzano. Bozzano controlled the sugar and yeast in the city, which allowed illegal distilleries to make alcohol. Uh, Bozzano would actually then form alliances with the Volpe brothers, uh, and there were eight Volpe brothers. We're not going to get into all of that. But but basically, Bozzano allowed them to operate uh, out of a coffee shop in Middle Hill. And Bozzano recognized that it was better to make peace than make war. But, you know, like history always repeats itself, that was not going to last. Uh, the Volpe's were able to take over the uh, Neapolitan factions. And then they absorbed their rackets through Turtle Creek Valley, uh, Wil Wilmerding. Uh, and then the alliance between Bozzano and the Volpe's would end when the Volpe's began to encroach into East uh, East Liberty and the north side. Uh, Bazzano would get fed up with it, and he would send a hit squad and actually kill three of the Volpe brothers. The problem was there were still five Volpe brothers remaining, and they ended up going to the commission in New York, 
uh, to pretty much complain that this guy was doing unsanctioned hits. As a result, the commission agreed with the Volpe's uh, and the situation they were going, uh, enduring essentially, and the commission sentenced Bozzano to death. Bozzano was basically told to come to New York to explain his actions, to which he did, but he never left. Uh, his body would be found on the streets in Red Hook, which is in Brooklyn, uh, having been stabbed 50 times and strangled. Uh, with Bozzano dead, his number two stepped into the role, his name, Vincenzo Capizzi, but in 1937 with the volatile warring, he said, fuck this shit, I don't want anything to do with it, so he steps aside. Uh, choosing to live rather than die. Frank Amato then sort of steps in, and he begins to expand all the rackets in Pittsburgh. He then vied for control of the gambling rackets in all of Allegheny County. Then in 1956, he would sort of become sick, and he would step down, and then we, the infamous John LaRocca would then take over. Um, LaRocca would basically run the family for 30 years. In 1957, LaRocca was at the infamous Appalachian meeting with Capo Gabriel uh, Manorino and Michael Genovese. Uh, LaRocca was able to actually get out of the house without being caught, but the two captains, uh, Manorino and Genovese, weren't so lucky they ended up getting arrested. Uh, LaRocca would then further push into territories, and he would also cement close friendships with Santos Traficante, uh, and get involved in business with him in Cuba and in Florida. And LaRocca was the actual secret player in the San Susi Hotel and Casino uh, in Havana, which was a big place. Uh, LaRocca would use his power and money to influence and control politics, police, and pretty much any official he could get his hands on in Pittsburgh. Uh, he also controlled the labor unions in the city through the local 1058. Uh, LaRocca would then cement his relationship with Carlo Gambino, Russell Buffalino, Angelo Bruno, and Nick Savella, based out of Chicago. Uh, once you get to the 1960s, uh, LaRocca ends up having a beef with the Cleveland Mafia as LaRocca begins to move into Youngstown, Ohio, which created a lot of problems. Then in 1984, LaRocca would end up dying and Michael Genovese would take over. Uh, Genovese would move the family into the narcotics trade. Uh, with that and losing whatever big political influence they had at the time, it really hurt uh, the mob in Pittsburgh. Uh, they began to lose members. And to long sentences, death, uh, you know, and other things, the FBI kept getting convictions. Old members started dying off, and they didn't really have a whole bunch of people left. To my knowledge, they're still there, still active, but the likelihood that they're a family is probably not the case at this point. Uh, they still control gambling and other things, but I don't think that they have the recognition that they once did. Uh, and word from what I understand is that membership is very low. It's not to say that they haven't had any sort of resurgence, uh, because I'm sure, like everything else, uh, you can't totally kill something off, but I'm not going to say that they're uh, a big crime family either at the same point. All right. Do you guys still have political power as far as local level councilmen and mayors and things like that? Or do you think the days of even owning the local guys have done? Uh, I think in some cases, yes. I, I don't think it's major. I think it would be like minor things like, like you said, city council and some other things like that. I think they would use them specifically for like zoning laws, construction permits, uh, stuff that they're having problems with to make money. I'm sure that they grease people. But the days of controlling local government are pretty much over as far as I'm concerned. But it, 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 I just I think it happens to some extent, but I don't think it's like it was in the 60s. Uh, but for instance, Providence, Rhode Island uh, was always controlled. Uh, for 40 years, it was controlled in every facet with politics. Uh, for instance, if you wanted to be a police officer, you had to bribe City Hall. That's just the way it's worked in Providence, and that's probably the way it always will work. Providence has always been corrupt uh, and probably will be. All right. What's the status of the Buffalino crime family now? Uh, he seems smart enough to in ensure their longevity. Uh, from what I understand, they're, they're still active. They're not the powerhouse, obviously, that they once were. I, I don't think that there is uh, a huge conglomerate, but I still think they're there. And I, I think they've locally, they, they've probably fallen under the Genovese umbrella more than anything or the Gambino umbrella at this point. Are they active? Absolutely. Uh, but as far as to who's doing what, I, I couldn't tell you. Uh, listen, after Russell Buffalino died, the family lost an insane amount of power and prestige. Uh, not to say that that those after Buffalo you know, were bad. That's not the case at all. I just think that Russell had such a respect from all the other families uh, that, you know, other families wouldn't have tried to encroach on his turf. Whereas these days they might because they don't maybe not necessarily have the fear that they used to have. When somebody is that powerful and, and they're done or they die or they go to prison, it's hard to really recapture or resurrect the power that you had. 
Providence, once again, is another example of this. After Ray Patriarca Sr. died and Ray Jr. took over, things weren't the same. Uh, Ray Jr. didn't have the power or the fear to continue, and guys weren't afraid of him. And when you have that situation, you're going to see a lot of ebb and flow and a lot of power vacuums. But today, things in Providence, and I mean this like as in right now, things are aligned very different in Providence now. And I think who they have now in charge, at least from my perspective, it's a highly intelligent move. It's a smart decision, and it's a solid move. Uh, I just wish, and this is just me, I wish they would stop changing where they base their headquarters. Pick Boston or Providence, you know, already. All right. Uh, I don't know if you've answered this question, uh, but who killed Alan Dorfman, and did it have anything to do with the Hoffa disappearance? This is a very, very long answer, but I, I'm going to give it to you as best I can. For those who don't know who Alan Dorfman is, let's let's sort of address that part first. Dorfman had basic mob pedigree as his stepfather was a mob heavyweight named Paul Red Dorfman. Uh, his stepfather was the head of the Chicago Waste Handlers Union, and he was also a kingpin in the, in the outfit. Excuse me. Uh, his stepfather would have some serious problems as he ends up getting caught stealing money from the AFL-CIO union health accounts and, and sort of began, began paying his personal bills with that. Uh, the connection between Allen and Hoffa came through his stepfather. Um, through his father, he would meet Joey Glimco, who was a racketeer and labor union, uh, labor union leader for the outfit. Uh, through Glimco, he would end up meeting Paul DeLuca and Sam Giancana. Uh, it was through his stepfather that, uh, like we said, Allen met Hoffa. In 1949, Allen would form the Union Insurance Agency and obtain the contracts to provide health and welfare insurance for the Teamsters, the Central States Union. We've talked about that before. If you're unfamiliar about the Central States Union, go back to last week's show and listen to the Jimmy Hoffa episode. We talked all about that. Uh, but basically, uh, he ends up getting questioned at the McClellan hearings as to his role of excessive fees being paid by the Teamsters to Alan Dorfman's own company. Uh, in other words, he was skimming. Uh, those skims were kickbacks that went directly to Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, in turn, that money would also be used uh, as loans uh, to the mafia to open places in Las Vegas. Dorfman and Hoffa were very tight, and it was Dorfman who paid the bribe to the juror to get Hoffa off the criminal case in Tennessee. Uh, after Hoffa goes to prison, Dorfman takes over the Central States Pension Fund, and then he would later make a huge loan for $160 million to Argent Corporation, which was the shell corporation that owned a lot of the mob control casinos, which also included the Stardust. Um, by 1977, Dorfman was out uh, and, and lost control of the pension fund. Uh, for uh, Basically, in, in over the next preceding years, he had a lot of legal issues. Like, for example, in 74, he would be indicted for fraud for taking $1.4 in loans, which is made by the Teamsters Fund to American Pale Company and Gaylor Products. Uh, indicted with him was Joey the Clown Lombardo, Tony Spilatro, uh, Erwin Wiener, and a bunch of other people. Between 59 and 69, the Central States Pension Fund loans really went, they, they went unpaid. Uh, the case would collapse after Dan Seifer, who was the main witness against the group, got killed. Uh, it's worth noting that Lombardo would later be convicted for that murder. Uh, so in 1979, things got bad. The feds ended up wiretapping Dorfman's office, the information the feds got, and uh, well, they were able to basically indict Dorfman and four other people. In May of 1981, Dorfman would get convicted with Roy Lee Williams, who at the time was the Teamsters president, along with Joey Lombardo, who was convicted of bribing Howard Cannon, who was the Democratic senator from Nevada. Uh, three days before sentencing, Dorfman ends up getting whacked outside the Lincolnwood Hyatt Park Hotel parking lot. Uh, Erwin Wiener uh, was with Dorfman when he got hit, but was unharmed in the hit, which sort of tells you that Erwin likely either was in on it or he knew it was going to happen, or it's just complete fucking sheer luck. Uh, but I don't believe in luck. That's just the truth. So to answer your question, uh, I don't think Dorfman was involved in Hoffa disappearing, but he likely knew it was coming down the road and likely knew the players. Uh, you couldn't be the mob's front man in Vegas and not know those things. Uh, so why was he killed? Simple. The mob lost control of the scam in Vegas. They were furious about that. They also feared that Dorfman might talk, considering he was facing a 55-year sentence. 
Uh, they wanted to limit the scope of the government peeking into their, their union business and et cetera. So it, it could be possibly that they just feared he might talk and they might have been a little worried that he knew what happened to Hoffa and was afraid he'd say something. So he's got to go. All right. Did Venaro Mangano retire from underboss after his 2006 arrest and conviction or is he still being used till the end? Because if so, I'm amazed the guy not, never got elevated to boss. Also, why was Mangano not made boss of the Genovese crime family after Gigante's death? Uh, first of all, uh, Benny Eggs, and that's who we're talking about, he suffered, I think, two or three heart attacks while he was actually in prison during the Windows case, uh, and it actually left him really fucked up health-wise. Uh, he ended up being partially blind, and he was wheelchair-bound as a, as a result. So his options, I mean, were pretty limited. They were going to put a guy that had that kind of health problems in his boss, and Mangano really, uh, he wasn't actually convicted or arrested in 2006. He actually got arrest, uh, excuse me, released from prison in 2006. Uh, had he been healthy, who knows, but I, I think the reality is he just was too sick to, to take over. All right, could you rank the three, the five families in current strength? All right. Uh, in my opinion, Gambino, Genovese, Bonanno, Colombo, Lucchese. There you go. Once again, the five families in current strength. Gambino, Genovese, Bonanno, Colombo, and Lucchese. All right. In your opinion, who are the biggest rats of them all? Boy, I, I, I could go down a list of this shit. Uh, Joe Valacci, Philip Leonetti, and Sammy Gravano are the three biggest rats I think that have ever ever been fucking born. All three of them should be in the ground. One of them is. The other two are well in their way, I hope. All right. Do you know about Tony Gambino, grandson of Lucky Luciano? Was he a rat? First of all, Tony Gambino is not the grandson of Lucky Luciano. That's number one. Uh, for those that don't know, Lucky Luciano didn't have any children. Uh, Tony Gambino is, or at least has been called a fraud by a bunch of different people. Nobody in those circles have ever heard of Tony Gambino. He claims to have grown up in a family. Uh, but once again, Nobody's ever heard of the guy. Uh, a few years ago, because he has claimed to do 20 years in federal prison, I did a BOP search on him, uh, and that name does not exist in any of the Federal Bureau of Prisons records, and even rats have records in the database. Even if they became rats, it still shows them at prison. This name didn't show up. Tells me the guy's a fraud. He's a fake. Uh, and it's somebody who made up a, a name and a legacy that just absolutely doesn't exist. you got to be careful. There's a lot of those guys out there that, that tell great stories, but they, they really, nobody's ever heard of them. He's one of them. All right. The setting is 1960. There's a dispute in Vegas over the skim and the Gambinos wanting a bigger piece of the pie that sh than Chicago has. There's a war between the two families alone, both arguably at their height. Who comes out on top? Accardo, Giancana, Paul Rica, the outfit versus Carlo Gambino, fa crime family. Uh, listen, at the end of the day, I, I think ultimately the Gambinos win that, and, and I'm going to tell you why. Because ultimately they would have gotten the Genovese's, the Lucchese's, the Columbo's, and the Bonanno's involved, and those guys together outweigh Chicago any day of the week, uh, especially when it comes to money. I mean, not to say Chicago wasn't strong. They were. Uh, but I think there's no way the outfit could have taken on the five families. Uh, and and I, I think Carlo Gambino on his own was more powerful than, than a lot of people combined. Uh, I mean, the guy could shut down the fucking port, for Christ's sakes. All right. If a person switches families, do their rackets go with them or do they, do they split up? It really depends on who you're under. If a guy's making a killing under one guy, then switches to another guy, usually it could get pretty ugly and, and there's a lot of you know, penalties that are paid and stuff like that. At least it's been my experience when I've known people that have been in that situation. Uh, but we've seen it happen before with many mob guys fighting over an earner. This guy makes a lot of money, etc. you know. Uh, but like I said, it's been my experience that there's usually like a buyout. Uh, and, and then that's the end of it. Or or there's a percentage of, of, of a, a racket that gets kicked back. Uh, but, but usually once a guy is on the record with somebody... Uh, and then goes to something else, usually it just transfers over. It just depends on the situation and how much money is involved. All right, which bosses got along with one another? John Gotti, Carmine Persico, and which bosses did not get along? Um, hmm. All right, so let me reread this because it's a multiple thing here. All right, wh uh, which bosses got along with one another? John Gotti and Carmine Persico, and which bosses did not get along with the others in the John Gotti era? And do you think Ron Previty can eat uh, the Nathan's hot dog eating? Do you think that Ron Previty could uh, out eat the Nathan's hot dog eating champion 
and the over under on how many Previty would eat. Uh, John Gotti was close to Ray Patriarca, very very close. Gigante was close to Patriarca as well, uh, Bru- uh, as well as to Bruno and Nicky Scarfo. Uh, Gambino was tight with Lucchese. Uh, and Patriarca Genovese. Uh, Ge- Vito Genovese, however, his real, his closest ally was Joe Bonanno. Uh, Ron Previty could swallow a whale's cock, if that tells you anything. So, I, Ron Previty. So, I hope that answers that. All right. Had Vito Genovese not been so violent and egotistical, do you think he would have been as powerful as Gambino? Absolutely, unequivocally. And we're going to talk about Vito Genovese a little bit today. But I think if Vito Genovese had just sat back and done the right thing, I, he could have been as powerful, I think. Uh, but I don't think his ego or mouth would have allowed that to happen. All right. You talk about how Carl, ew, you talk about how Carlo and Neil really didn't trust each other, but worked well with each other. Now, now I've got a question about another boss and underboss and what kind of relationship did Angelo Bruno and Phil Testa have? Did they trust each other and did they get along? And what was the reason Angelo Bruno chose Phil Testa? Bruno didn't choose Testa. Bruno got whacked. Uh, it was New York who put Testa in. Uh, Scarfo, listen, Nicky Scarfo was offered the role by Vinny Gigante, but, but Scarfo turned it down, let Phil Testa take over. Uh, but no, Bruno had no decision in that because he was dead. He got killed. Uh, so that, that was more of a, uh, a decision. I, I think that was supported by the commission at that point. All right. Are there young guys made today like any other, th- any under 30 or 35, uh, or are the books still closed? To my knowledge, some guys have gotten made recently. I, I'm not going to get into how recently, uh, but uh, as far as young guys, say 35 and under, who are made, I, I know of a few that are. Uh, be one's 32, one's 35, one's 37, one's 40. So yeah, I mean, young guys do get made, but you know, it's it's different with each family. Uh, to be honest with you. Uh, but who they are, I'm not going to even talk about them. So, all right. What are the chances uh, of Lucchese Street Boss, official underboss Stephen Crea, and lead capo Matty Madonna will beat their federal indictments? Do the feds have a lot of evidence on uh, murder charges that might uh, and might get them on nonviolent part of the indictment? Uh, you know, I... I, I mm. All right, the feds do not have a lot, of, a lot of evidence on murder charges and might get them on nonviolent part of the indictment. Who knows? We'll see what happens. The upcoming trial will be very interesting. Um, there's a couple of things, and, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the show, that I wish I could talk about uh, because I, I, I may know a little bit more about this case than a lot of people only because, and I, well, I can't even tell you really because, uh, but there were... Uh, two people that were informants living next door to each other. Uh, I'm not going to mention their names, but they were living next door to each other, committing crimes together, all this other shit. And they gave the FBI information on both Stephen Crea and Maddie Madonna. Now, the FBI has long denied that these two rats were living together and that they didn't know, but that's a bullface fucking lie. Uh, and it's a bullface lie because I have more than enough proof that it's a bullface lie. And in and, and fact, and, and I, I got to be very careful what I say here because I don't want to uh, really get my, my nose more involved in this than it already is. But what I will tell you is this. The two fucking rat bastard pieces of shit that gave the feds information didn't even know either one of these guys. They made up a bunch of shit. The feds are just taking a bunch of shit and running with it. And then the feds are trying to deny that they put two fucking Witzek rats living right next door to each other. The problem is there's photos and videotape evidence of it. So uh, that's my whole part. So if, if we go on the theory that the, ev- uh, that the FBI took evidence from these two garbage pails and used it to help indict Maddie Madonna and Stephen Crea, and I know for 100% fact that... And, and I don't say that just because I've seen stuff. I, I might have been around some of this stuff. So what I'm telling you is is that uh, if the FBI levies indictments based on the words of these two pricks, and then the FBI is also denying these two were put living next door to each other, and there's certifiable 100% proof that I could put out right now about that, then it's kind of hard to believe what the FBI is alleging. Uh, the more and more I keep seeing this, the more and more I just keep shaking my head, and I cannot fucking believe that the FBI keeps getting away with this shit, to be honest with you. Uh, 
and and what the specific allegations are. And this is what's so stupid. There was somebody else that was indicted for allegedly attempting to want to murder one of these informants. And it's so it's hysterical to me because. Uh, this guy was living in New Jersey next to another rat. He wasn't even living in the state where allegedly they tried to go look for this rat. Uh, one of the rats is the guy who ratted out John Riggie. Uh, the other one I'm not going to mention because he's just not worth mentioning. But if we're gonna if we're gonna take the FBI's case and believe all these indictments based on some words from these two pukes. Then on the other side of the page, you you full well know that the FBI put these two together. Now they're now the FBI is lying and denying it when I know it's fucking true. Uh, attorneys know it's true, and I may or may not have been contacted by uh, defense attorneys in this case to ask me what I knew as far as rats living next door to each other or whatever because I've done some investigative stuff and and, and other stuff. Uh, you know, that's that's a big that's a big like blinking fucking light that's an elephant in the fucking room and so you know you, you tell them whatever you know and and, and when uh, the government denies something and you know it's the opposite and you have like certifiable proof it, it just it, and then defense attorneys call you and ask you because they cannot believe this shit there you go so i i'm gonna stay out of it as far as everything else goes with this case but like i've always said be careful what you believe because a lot of it is bullshit. Uh, they do a lot of things that are that are twisted. Uh, it's like when Donnie Brasco said he never broke any laws. And the minute that he leaves the fucking FBI, he starts admitting to breaking laws. Piece of shit that guy is. All right. Is there any truth to the report I read on a couple of mob Facebook pages that a certain members of the Gallo crew beat the living crap out of Neil Delacroach? Uh, if they did, they were certainly taking one hell of a risk just laying a finger on a made man. If it's not true, where the fuck do these tales emerge from? No, that's not true. Unequivocally not true. Delacroach at the time was an underboss to Carlo Gambino. You think Joey Gallo is going to put his hands on an underboss? Are you out of your mind? Like, really? Uh, so there's no way that, that Gallo ever would have done that. It's total lies. These are the same Facebook groups that call themselves by a mob boss's name, then they support journalists who talk shit about these guys. It's, just, it's the dopiest shit. Uh, I am a member. Uh, a lot of people have added me to these group pages on Facebook. I, I really don't even go into them because it's all nonsense. Nobody knows what they're talking about in any of these groups. And every once in a while, it's good for entertainment purposes to go in and kind of laugh at them. But the reality of it is, is that you cannot believe what they say. You can't. Uh, just like there are websites that you can go to and, and start reading shit. The information is so reckless. It's so untrue. Uh, but people love that shit. They love that shit. And everybody thinks they're a fucking expert in these fucking things. Uh, you know, people people have tried to say I was an expert. And I always tell them I'm not. I'm not. An expert is somebody that knows everything, has been involved in all that. I'm not an expert. Nobody's an expert. The experts are the mobsters themselves. They're the fucking experts, not me. Uh, so when people say that I've uh, allegedly said that about myself, I've never said that about myself, ever. And I never will. I never will. I never will. Uh, but you can't believe anything you see in these group pages. They, they, you know, it's the same thing over and over again. They, they, they talk gossip. They talk nonsense. And they post private family photos of these guys like they know them. And it's just... The mentality is a little strange to me. I will never, never, never understand it. All right. What happens to Bugsy and Meyer Lansky if Lucky Luciano doesn't survive the murder attempt in 1929? Uh, look, I, I, I think Lansky still would have been, I, I think he still would have risen to the top uh, because he was too smart and too valuable not not to. Uh, he was. He made a lot of money for the mob, put together a lot of stuff for them. Uh, and maybe Bugsy Siegel doesn't get killed, uh, because maybe Lansky might have given him a pass. Maybe things would have different, but I think ultimately for what Bugsy Siegel did, he should have been killed. His death was warranted if you're going to go by a street code. Uh, but you know, who knows what would have, who knows what would have happened. But then again, without Luciano, maybe Lansky and Bugsy don't become who they were in their own right. Because without Luciano, Lansky really was brought into the fold by Luciano. So we could play it a million different ways. We just we just don't really know. But that's definitely a lot of things to think about. When Al Capone went to jail, why didn't Ralph stay in power? I heard he was kicked out of the mafia. Uh, Ralph was never kicked out of the mob at all. It's just the fact that when his brother died, you know, whatever clout he might have had uh, sort of went away. But he controlled gambling stuff in the vice districts. Uh, but that was that was pretty much it. 
That was pretty much it. All right. Was Joey Merlino ever convicted of a felony, and will he be able to vote in the 2020 elections? Uh, yes, Joey Merlino has been convicted of felonies. Uh, convicted felons cannot vote unless they get their rights restored, and you can only get those rights restored based on certain criteria and offenses. Uh, but Joey does not fall under any of those criteria. So no, Joey doesn't get a vote. But if Joey was going to vote, he's going to vote for Donald Trump. I'm telling you because I know Joe. All right. Uh, I never ask questions, and I have a few old-timers who usually give me a pretty accurate answer, so this one's going to be a little bit different. Uh, if the mob post the formation of the commission avoided backing big political figures such as the Kennedys uh, and Joe Bonanno never publishing his book, what would Cosa Nostra look like today? That's a great question, and it's one I actually think about a lot. Uh, what would things sort of look like? Uh, obviously, we you know we can't change history, right? So you never know at the end of the day. But I think that had they avoided the Kennedys, the CIA stuff, uh, some of the more political things, uh, the Bay of Pigs, the killing Castro, all of that crazy shit, I think the mob today would absolutely be be huge. But I don't think that they would be. Uh, I think it would be a little convoluted because technology has changed so much and, and it's so much easier to get caught these days with technology. So I don't think necessarily that that would have changed history. I think it just would have de de delayed the inevitable. I still think the same thing would have happened. It just would have been a little bit more delayed. So some of these guys might have had a longer run, but we can go back even further than that. Uh, Joe Valachi, Joe Valachi put it on the map. He doesn't say what he says, then that gets delayed by about 10 to 20 years. Kennedy shit. You, so you see my point? Everything has like a domino effect to it. All right. Most powerful, Gambino or Ricardo? Carlo Gambino. Uh, have you seen the Lewisburg doc where Herbie Sperling calls out Nicky ba Barnes calling him a punk for ratting on his son? I have not seen that. I will admit that. Uh, was Bill Buffalino rated, related to Russell Buffalino? No. He was allowed to use the last name to sort of give himself some credentials as a lawyer, uh, to sort of give himself protection from other people, but no, they were not related. All right, is there any proof that John Gotti ever pulled a trigger? I don't believe so. Is it evidence or rumor? Uh, listen, I haven't seen evidence. Uh, rumors, absolutely. There's always rumors, but is there anything concrete? Absolutely not. I can't say that there is. All right, what do you think of the making of the mob docuseries that that was on? Was it factual? Some facts, yes, but like I say with everything, but when you rely on the bulkier information coming from the feds and, the, and rats, you lose validity. You just lose some credibility. That's just the way it is. All right, what were the reasons for Jack McGurn getting whacked? Well, for starters, he was behind the planning of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Um when Frank Loesch, who was the chairman of the Chicago Crime Commission, put out a public enemies list, McGurn ended up on the list, sort of pissed off the outfit. They wanted him to just sort of go away, stay quiet, uh, and he didn't. And, and while it sucks that somebody printed a name and put it in, in a publication, the outfit sort of just looked at it a different way. And they looked at it as somebody who wouldn't shut up, wouldn't stay in the shadows, just wouldn't just stay off the fucking radar. Uh, and the outfit then sort of, as a result, shuns him. They won't have anything to do with him. And then what McGurn does is he tries to become a pro golfer, which further enrages uh, the outfit due to television cameras seeing him and him giving interviews. He ended up calling himself by a fake name. And what happens is there were reports that got back to the police that it was Jack McGurn. Uh, and what happens is they end up going to the golf course and arresting him. That got publicized. The outfit didn't like it. Uh, they felt like he should retire uh, and just shut the fuck up, but he wouldn't, and that's exactly why he got killed. All right, can you explain mafia codes and rules and what the mafia high threats are and how and, and low ones, too? Uh, don't exactly understand this question, but I... Uh, well, was Al Capone ever made as well, or was he not? I've heard many, I've heard many reasons... Jesus. Wow. All right. Let, let me let me restart this. Can you explain mafia codes and rules and what mafia high threats are and low ones are? Was Al Capone ever made or was he not? I've read many reasons that uh, he wasn't Sicilian, so he got into troubles with other members in the mob. So what's the truth? All right. Uh, I think I can sort of disassemble this question here. Uh, listen, you you don't have to be Sicilian to be made. You can be Italian, but your father has to be Italian. It depends. Now it's back to 100% from what I understand, but that's number one. Number two, 
from what I heard, Al Capone was never made. Uh, that being said, what lends itself to that is is Capone getting sort of, um, you know, Capone ends up kind of when he takes over tossing the made man shit out the window, and he didn't even make his own men. Uh, he would have Irish guys in his crew, other guys, Jewish guys, but it wasn't always strictly Italian with Al Capone. Uh, it was a different time period. As far as rules and codes, uh, listen, they've changed over the years a lot. And uh, listen, I'm not in the mafia, so I couldn't tell you what. If, if you walk into a fucking social club and there's a list of rules, do not eat off George's plate. Do not throw trash in Dominic's garbage bin. I, how the fuck should I know? Uh, but what I can tell you is, is a lot of it's common sense. Uh, you get called, you go. You don't say no to anybody. You just do what they ask you. You show up when you're supposed to show up. You do as requested. Uh, you don't bang a maid guy's wife. You don't hang out. You don't even go to her house uh, to visit with a maid guy's wife if you're a male. Uh, it's just common sense stuff. Every decade seems to have its own tradition and values and rules. So, all right. Have you seen the movie Find Me Guilty with Vin Diesel? What do you think? I don't like Vin Diesel. I've never liked that motherfucker ever. I don't like his acting abilities. I don't like what he represents. I don't like what he looks like. So there you go. I haven't seen, I think I've seen one movie he did and I didn't like it. Uh, I think he's sort of a, uh, a fucking joke. And I think that he is a stereotype of what an action star wants to be, but isn't. So there you go. All right. What mobster do you think had the worst luck? Like got the stiffest sentence that maybe he didn't deserve. Uh, what guys got absolutely screwed? Uh, Tony Salerno. Greg Scarpa, Gene Gotti, Phil Narducci, and George Borghese. They all got fucked. They all did time for shit they shouldn't have gotten time for because they didn't do shit. Uh, and and it's, Tony Salerno, 100 years should be in the boss. He wasn't the boss. Greg Scarpa Jr. got punished because of his father. Gene Gotti had to take a fucking 30-year pinch when in reality... He could have taken a plea that got him. He could have taken a plea that would have given him fifty years. But his brother had the rule: nobody takes a plea, nobody takes a plea, nobody admits to nothing. But yet, John Gotti took a plea. So there's a little hypocrisy there. Uh, you know, as far as uh, George and, and and Phil and uh, guys, just got uh, you. You got to look into what happened to George Borghese. He's getting ready to get out of prison, and they reindict him again for a bunch of bullshit. Just a bunch of bullshit. And guess what? He was acquitted of everything. So there you go. All right. Uh, what kind of man was Paul Vario? Uh, was he anything like the character in Goodfellas? No, he was a little different. Uh, he was an easygoing guy, but he was a dangerous guy. Uh, but any correlation to Paul Servino, to Paul Vario, just it's a very, very, very wide gap. Uh, Paul was a good guy, a smart guy, a dangerous guy, uh, but uh, had some other attributes that, that I'm not going to get into because it's just a little disrespectful, but he sort of had a, like a, a sexual dysfunction kind of thing going on. Uh, but... I don't want to get into that, but by all accounts, he, he was a dangerous guy, but but he wasn't Paul Servino. All right, what do you think about the movie Once Upon a Time in America, the long version? I enjoy it, but it's way too fucking long. It, it's really one of my favorite movies. It's actually on Netflix right now. Uh, it's a great film, but it's just so fucking long. <laughs> you know, you you got to sit there for a five-hour journey, you know. Uh, why, what, what would Gene Gotti and John Carniglia roles have been in the Gambino family if they didn't get pinched in 89? Would they have made it to the top panel? Uh, I think they would have still ended up in prison at some point. But like I just said earlier, I think the, tra the trajectory of it all would have been a little different. I Listen, I always felt bad for Gene because of John's stupid fucking nobody takes pleas stance. Uh, but yet John Gotti took a, a plea in a murder case. So, I mean, it's like you telling the apples stay on the tree and you jump off the tree yourself. It just doesn't, you know, it's a shame. It's a shame. Uh there's a little hypocrisy there, but but yeah, I think they both would have moved up the ranks, but we're we're never going to know. All right, what was meant by Joey Merlino going to a halfway house? Uh, it basically means he's going to go to a house where the people who are getting out of prison live. He goes to work for a couple hours a day until the sentence is over, and that's the end of it. They have to they have to leave by a certain time, be back by a certain time, and that's the end of it. All right, do you think Dominic Montiglio would have still snitched had Nino let him actually get made, and or if the family didn't put the green light on him? Uh, I don't think Dominic would have ever talked had Nino just let him just be who he was. Uh, Nino forced a lot of things with Dominic. Now, granted, Dominic made a lot of choices. We, you know, he ended up a piece of shit rat. We know that. But I think that had he supported Dominic like a son rather than push him into a certain way of life, I think his story would have been a, a very, very different. But like once again, 
you know, Dominic made decisions and he has to live with them. And, uh, and, and that's, that's really that. Um, I don't think Dominic did it out of not being made at all. I think he just did it out of, he wanted out of the life. He wanted away from him and he just like a coward ratted on everybody. And that's just, uh, that's just the, uh, the reality of it. All right, how powerful is the Israeli ma- Israeli mafia? I heard the Abergil family is a global organization. This is a show I'm actually getting ready to put out. It's already been done, and it's very good. It'll be out in the next couple weeks. All right, does the mob have any interest in internet gambling, poker, sportsbook? Absolutely, 100%. They also control a lot of the porn. Uh, so if you people are out there paying for porn, who do you think you're paying? All right, any new books or movies or documentaries coming out on the Philadelphia Mafia? Nothing to my knowledge, no, but I'm sure Dave Anesthesia is going to, or excuse me, Dave, wow, I combined both of those jerk-offs together. I'm sure George will come out with another rap book. He's good for that. All right, why was Vito Rizzuto brought all the way from Canada to participate in the infamous hit on the Three Capos in New York, and why would somebody of his stature get his hands dirty like that? That's a question I ask, I ask myself a lot. Uh, listen, Massino needed outside help. He brought the guys in from Canada. I have no idea why he did that. I don't know why. I think Rizzuto did it as an olive branch to keep the families close, but that's also the same thing that drove the families apart. Uh, it was a dumb idea, and it really did come back to haunt Vito Rizzuto at the end. Uh, but I guess farming work out is one thing, but it just doing that just didn't work out for anybody. Is the mob still active in Connecticut? They are, and that's Genovese territory. Mad Dog Sullivan claimed in a video that he did the hit on Tony Caponegro. Do you think he is bullshitting? No. Absolutely not. Listen, Mad Dog Sullivan is a lot of things, but he was a fucking tough guy. Uh, he didn't need to bullshit about anything. So, I mean, if he says it, I believe it. Are you ever going to do a lefty gun show? Absolutely. Uh, I'd assume it's not mafia related, but do we know if Jeffrey Epstein was murdered? Uh, well, the autopsy came out and it said that, uh, he hung himself. I don't believe that for a second. Uh, I would love to get into that whole, and that's a whole fucking show in and of itself. Uh, but I, I, I don't, I don't think he killed himself. I, I think he had too much dirt on too many high powered people. Uh, the, the mere fact that like two weeks prior or a week prior, he allegedly tried to uh, kill himself. Then, uh, a lot of people have asked me if that was a botched hit. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just think if you're going to kill a motherfucker in a cell, you just kill a motherfucker. What is that, a dry run? You do a, a dry run a week before, and now we do the real thing? I mean, I just think if you're going to kill somebody, you're going to kill them. Uh, but I, I think that the FBI is going to have a real problem on their fucking hands now, especially when you look at what happened to Whitey Bulger and, and now this. Uh, you know, FBI is going to be under some serious scrutiny, in which they should. Which they should. All right. All that being said, those are all the questions I am going to cover today because the Luciano story is a big one. Uh, so all that being said, if I didn't get to your question, uh, just remind me, inbox me at Real Mob Talk 7 over on Twitter. Check us out on Facebook, Mob Talk Radio. And if I didn't get to it, remind me or ask again, and I'll add it to the list. Uh, you know, as, as we keep going, I, I typically try to keep Q&A questions to about an hour, hour 10, because the show that I'm going to do here in a second uh, is pretty significant. Uh, as far as Lucky Luciano goes, and we, we are going to talk about the biography of Luciano. Uh, Luciano was so big in so many ways. There's a million different angles to cover. I'm going to try to keep it as basic as I can. If I start going to the left and to the right of things, we're never going to get it done. Uh, but I, I like to just give facts. I think there's a lot of things about Lucky Luciano people don't realize. Uh, and we are going to get to that. But what we're going to do right now is we are going to take a quick break. Uh, and when we come back, we are going to get to Lucky Luciano. So stay tuned on Mob Talk Radio. We get illy, tough like South Philly. Got the cold steel, it's about to get chilly. Major figures like Gilly, I'm an outlaw kid, Billy. How the fuck am I funny? You'll get slapped silly. Learn from the OGs, respect what you're shown. Real stand up guys like Sonny Mazzone and Joey Merlino. We bring beef like Gino. Steak out at your house with a hidden name, Nino. Ah. I know the gutter real well. My dude's coming through with that gunpowder smell. If you can't tell, I enjoy hell. G's moving solid, so never hear me yell. Stay 
Stand up guys, rise, no disguise, we in the place Thick ass thieves, nobody is safe Reality rap, don't touch the waters Cold of the streets, you gotta follow orders Stand up guys, rise, no disguise, we in the place Thick ass thieves, nobody is safe Reality rap, don't touch the waters Cold of the streets, you gotta follow orders Knock around guys, wise to the halfways, better than most. Even on my bad days, meetings in cafes, strip clubs and bars. At any time it's rock and roll, but we don't have guitars. Fuck fancy cars, I'm low key in the beat. I know a couple young boys who stay with the heat. I need a chick like three to rob Paul to pay Peter. You couldn't walk in my shoes, not even half a meter. Young Turks, smack off your smirks. And what they don't want to see, like a million Jimmy Perks. Stand up guys, rise, no disguise, we in the place Thick ass thieves, nobody is safe Reality rap, don't touch the waters Cold of the streets, you gotta follow orders Stand up guys, rise, no disguise, we in the place Thick ass thieves, nobody is safe Reality rap, don't touch the waters Cold of the streets, you gotta follow orders Welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are talking about Lucky Luciano. Salvatore Lucania was born in November of 1897 uh, in La Cara, Fritti, Sicily. Uh, at nine years old, his family emigrates to New York City, settling in Manhattan, specifically on the Lower East Side. By most accounts, he was a terrible student, uh, had a small form of dys- dyslexia, uh, which caused him a lot of different problems in school. At 14, he ends up quitting school, and he would begin delivering hats for $7 a week. The job didn't last long as he placed basically his paycheck into the numbers game, and he actually wins $244. At that point, he realizes there's more money to be made on the streets than working a regular 9-to-5, and that's exactly what he did. Uh, Also, as a teenager, he would start his own gang and eventually be absorbed into the Five Points gang. Even at an early age, Luciano was way ahead of the curve as far as intelligence. Uh, Rather than concentrate on stick-ups, thefts, robberies, and other type of small, minuscule gang type of behavior, he actually began offering protection to Jewish, Italian, and Irish kids for 10 cents a week. So he was an entrepreneur from a very young age. Uh, He would actually move into pimping. Uh, and other things, but it's during this time that he would end up meeting Meyer Lansky. This, as the story goes, there are several tales as to how he met Meyer Lansky, but the one that I particularly believe is that uh, Meyer Lansky was getting abused a little bit, beat up by other people, and Luciano stepped in uh, and ended up uh, stopping something from happening, and basically what it was was I believe the story was is that Lucia, I believe it was Lansky was going to use a gun to defend himself, and uh, Luciano helped him out of a jam, and that's sort of how they became friends. There's a whole bunch of different stories and narratives as to how they met and got along and stuff like that. You can look those up for yourselves and kind of uh, pick and choose which one you want to believe. But as far as his nickname, nobody really knows how he got it, but there's a few theories. Uh, some couldn't pronounce his last name, so they called him Lucky for short. Another was because uh, he seemed to get a lot of, he was very lucky in a lot of things that he did, especially in 1929 when he survived getting slashed and beaten up by a bunch of mobsters because he refused to work for a local mob boss. Uh, from 1916 to about 1936, Lucky Luciano would be arrested some 25 times for various crimes, including gambling, assault, blackmail, and robbery, but was lucky enough hence the nickname, uh, not to do any time in prison. On January 17th of 1920, Prohibition begins. Also by 1920, Luciano pretty much had aligned himself self with some pretty recognizable names like Frank Costello, Vito Genovese, uh, who actually were partners and gang members in the Five Point Gangs with him. Uh, that same year, Luciano would be recruited by Joe Masseria to become a hitman, which he did. Also in 1920, Luciano would forge a relationship with Arnold the Brain Rothstein. It was through Rothstein that Luciano learned 
the essentials to pimping in the bootlegging business. Rothstein was so impressed with Luciano's ability to be able to learn quick and think on his feet that he bankrolled Luciano in the bootlegging business, and Luciano then in turn brought in Vito Genovese and Frank Costello as his partners. Uh, Rothstein is widely responsible for teaching Luciano how to operate on the streets. He teaches him how to move in and out of different social circles. Uh, being able to move in and out of high society and the streets was good for business. Uh, in 1923, Luciano was caught selling heroin to an undercover agent. He would actually be arrested, but no charges would ever be filed, leading to speculation that he dropped names to avoid going to prison. Uh, it's not going to be the first or the last time that people levy those allegations at Luciano like that. But as we go along here in his story, we're going to talk more about uh, that. Uh, the arrest for selling heroin uh, pretty much embarrassed Lucky Luciano and really gave him a bad reputation in the elite social circles that he was trying to be in. But Luciano had a, a plan to sort of gain back his reputation. He bought 200, 200 high-end seats for the Jack dempsey uh, Luis Firpo fight, and he handed them out to fellow gangsters, socialites, and politicians. Rothstein also recognized that Luciano dressed like shit and basically took him out and bought him expensive clothes so he could look the part. And between the tickets and the new threads, Luciano was able to regain his reputation. Rothstein always told him, act like a gentleman in public and they will always love you. Leave the brutality and the violence to the back alleys. And it was advice that Luciano never forgot. By 1925, Luciano was making a killing. He was pulling in roughly four, $12 million a year, uh, but after bribes, payoffs... He would actually be pulling in $4 million a year. Keep in mind, this is 1925. You guys can do the inflation, but that's a shitload of money. Uh, the bulk of Luciano's money came from bootlegging, which was the biggest bootlegging operation in the entire East Coast. Luciano was an impresario in the sense that he was able to form the rum routes, which would, he would later use for drugs. These are the routes that are still used today. Uh, as Luciano continued to show his value as an earner and a willing killer, Masseria gave him a promotion. Uh, Master Joe Masseria, by, all, by most accounts, was a bully, no education, had no manners, and he really rubbed Luciano and those around him the wrong way. He was an old-world boss and had old-world thoughts, and Luciano was sort of uh, more up-to-date with the trends. Uh, when Salvatore Maranzano comes to New York, he pretty much just announces he's the boss, and the shit just kind of hits the fan. Uh, Maranzano was effectively sent from Italy to New York to run the Castamolari clan. The Castamolari clan would ultimately become what we know today as the Bonanno crime family. Uh, the old world bosses, including Maranzano and Masseria, were old world guys. They didn't believe in working with anybody who was not Italian. Specifically, they didn't want to work with anybody that wasn't Sicilian. Uh, they would even work with uh, other Sicilians. But they had to. Be, they would work with with Sicilians, but they tried to keep it from with Sicilians that were from their own villages back in Italy. Uh, Luciano never really bought into that stupidity because he realized that despite all the bullshit, money was green, uh, and that's the motivation of every gangster. Uh, which is why he had zero issues working with blacks, Jews, the Irish, and etc. It also didn't help that Masseria would bust Luciano's balls about Frank Costello, who he was very fond of, basically poking fun at him for being a Calabrian. So once again, we, we, we see the, the antithesis of old-world mob bosses who don't want to deal with somebody that's not of their uh, specific own kind, as it were. They were almost uh, racist against other Italians. Um, anyhow, so... Masseria wasn't going to bend, and he wasn't going to allow Maranzano to encroach on his territory, and the Castamolari War officially begins. I don't want to go into the whole details of the Castamolari War, because I've covered it at least seven times on my show, but for the sake of time, it was basically about money and turf. There were two factions. On the Maranzano side, you had Maranzano, Joe Bonanno, Stefano Magadino, Joe Profaci, Joe Aiello, Gaito Gaitano, uh, Gaitano Rea, Tommy Gagliano, Tommy Lucchese, Nick Shiro, and Vito Bonaventure. On the Masseria side of things, you had Joe Masseria, Lucky Luciano, Frank Costello, Vito Genovese, Albert Anastasia, William, Willie Moretti, Joe Adonis, Carlo Gambino, Giuseppe Morello, and Manfredi Mineo. Uh, as shots would be fire, fired, Luciano began to meet with a few of these guys who would be called the Young Turks. Uh, Luciano saw old world bosses as ego-driven, borderline stupid, and didn't see the bigger picture in the grand scheme of things. Uh, Luciano would then lament that business should be business and there was enough money to go around for everybody to be content and that if war continued, everybody's either going to be dead in jail or fucking bankrupt. Uh, he knew 
law enforcement would only accept so much and that the heat and the violence would cripple the whole entire organized crime. And so it's just something that he felt that wasn't going to work in their best benefit. In 1929, before the war began, Maranzano actually attempts to have Luciano killed. He had Luciano kidnapped and stabbed and left for dead in Staten Island. Uh, obviously, Luciano would survive but would never forget it. As the war progressed, Luciano had seen enough. He knew as long as Maranzano and Masseria were left to continue warring, the game was over for everybody. But Luciano has a plan. The plan? To whack Masseria and Maranzano. The first obstacle of the plan was Masseria. The, the Masseria side was effectively losing the war to Maranzano, which some people have speculated was the reason why Luciano wanted out. But I really don't think that was the case. Uh, it was basically... Uh, it was a move to make a move. Uh, and if you're confused by that, just follow along and, and you'll understand. Luciano knew he had to stoke and stroke the ego of Maranzano. Otherwise, his plan isn't going to work. So he ends up meeting Maranzano privately and he offers to switch sides. He offers his undying allegiance to Maranzano. Luciano tells Maranzano that he would whack Masseria. And as a result of that, Luciano would absorb his rackets. But he wanted to be the number two in command of Masser Maranzano's family. Maranzano didn't have a problem with that whatsoever and agreed to it. Luciano then sets up a meeting with Masseria. Masseria and his two associates end up showing up. They ate, played cards, and at some point Luciano excuses himself to go use the bathroom. As he enters the bathroom, four men entered the restaurant and put Masseria out of his fucking misery. The shooters... Albert Anastasia, Vito Genovese, Joe Adonis, and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. With 12 shots, the war was over, and Luciano absorbed Masseria's family and rackets, and he ends up becoming the number two in the Maranzano crime family. After the death of Masseria, uh, Maranzano does something that people often confuse with Luciano. Uh, Maranzano recognized the structure of the mob. Uh, excuse me, he reorganized the structure of the mafia. Uh, he merged Italian gangs in New York City into five families. A lot of people say that Luciano did that, but that's not true. Uh, but but the way that this would work is that the mob families would be headed by Lucky Luciano, Joe Profaci, Gagliano, Mangano, and Maranzano. The understanding is that all the families would have the opportunity to make money and left to their devices. However, shortly after Maranzano... After the meeting, Maranzano names himself Boss of Bosses. Then in another meeting in upstate New York, he takes away the rackets of rival families and gives them to himself. Luciano was absolutely furious at the move. It created discontent, but he kept it to himself because he planned on never playing second fiddle to Maranzano. Other families weren't happy at this either, but everyone sort of kept quiet. Luciano felt that even though Masseria was a money whore, Maranzano was even worse for them. Uh, by September of 1931, Maranzano begins to realize a couple things. For starters, uh, he realizes that Lucky Luciano is beginning to gain a lot of power, uh, and he especially does not like the people that Luciano is hanging out with. He doesn't like the fact that Luciano likes Jews. He doesn't like the fact that Luciano likes the Irish. He really doesn't like the fact that Luciano uh, gets along so well with Costello. And he sort of realizes that he's not going to be able to put Luciano in his place. And he also realizes that Luciano could possibly overthrow him. So he decides Lucky Luciano's got to go. So what Maranzano does is he goes and he hires Mad Dog Call to whack him. Uh, Tommy Lucchese was allegedly at the meeting where this was discussed. And he ends up going directly to Luciano and he tells him what's going on. Maranzano, a couple days later, asks Vito Genovese and Lucky Luciano to meet him at his office at 230 Park Avenue in Manhattan. Luciano realized right then and there that it was likely going to be a murder set up, and he says, fuck this, we got to act first. So what Luciano does is, Luciano goes to Meyer Lansky, and he says, listen, provide me with four of your guys, and they were all Jewish guys, Jewish gangsters, uh, that were not recognizable by Maranzano's people. Uh, then what would happen is they would disguise themselves as government agents, walk in, and then they would disarm Maranzano's bodyguards with a bullshit warrant. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, Tommy Lucchese then walked in, pointed out who Maranzano was, and that's all they needed. They ended up stabbing Maranzano a dozen times before shooting and killing him. Uh, Luciano knew that killing Maranzano was one thing, but he also had to sort of grab the power base in a different kind of way. And this has been subject to a lot of debate. Uh, days later in Newark, New Jersey, the tortured body of Sam Monaco and uh, Louis Russo were found floating in the Newark Bay. Joe Saragusa, the Pittsburgh boss, was whacked in his home. Next up, uh, Joe Ardizone, who was boss of the Los Angeles Mafia, he goes to see 
disappears. Uh, scholars have often claimed that these were just random moves, not precipitated by Luciano, but I don't really know if that's the case. Now, if we look at who was close to who at the time, I, I don't believe that uh, that uh, Joe Androzone, who was boss of the, the, the Los Angeles crime family, I don't believe that that specifically had anything to do with Luciano outright. There was a Jack Dragna issue there, uh, Mickey Cohen issue there. Uh, but I think that for those things to happen, Luciano probably rem probably signed off on it, uh, you know. But I don't necessarily believe that this was all sort of a domino effect of what Luciano was trying to do. Because once Luciano takes out Ma Maranzano and Masseria, I mean, he's got it all to himself. Now they got to listen to him. So, you know, I, who knows? Who knows? But but I don't think that's necessarily the way that it went down. Uh, so. With Maranzano out of the way, Luciano ends up becoming head of the mafia. Uh, Luciano then could have easily named himself boss of bosses, and nobody would have said a thing, but he doesn't do that. Uh, he gets rid of the title. He knew that if there was one person over a whole conglomerate, it would cause war, and it would create problems, and it just wasn't worth the drama. He would end up installing the commission, but wanted to get rid of of the actual making ceremony itself. He felt that it was too Sicilian, it was old school, and they needed a new update. But Vito Genovese argues with him that the younger members need to learn obedience and structure and that they should keep the rule, and that's exactly what they did. Luciano keeps the rule. Um, and then what Luciano does is he promotes Genovese to his underboss, promotes Costello to his consigliere, makes Joe Adonis, Mike Coppola, Anthony Stroller, Willie Moretti, and Anthony Carfano all captains. Uh, as far as the commission goes, uh, Luciano really wanted everybody to feel like they had input into the direction of the mafia, uh, a place where they could handle disputes, decide on which family got which territory, and it was just designed to keep the peace and keep everybody moving forward. Uh, and the commission's first major problem comes in 1935. In 1935, Dutch Schultz comes to them because he wanted Thomas E. Dewey whacked. Dewey at the time was a special cross prosecutor, uh, who was making things uneasy for, easy for Dutch Schultz and other criminals. Luciano disagreed with Schultz, saying that killing him was the wrong idea. It would bring massive heat, uh, and law enforcement would just jump all over top of them. Uh, and Luciano reminded him, we don't kill women, we don't kill kids, we don't kill cops, and we don't kill judge, judges or any law enforcement officials. Schultz didn't agree with what Luciano said, and he basically told Luciano to go fuck himself and that he was either going to kill Dewey or his assistant, David Ash, in the next couple of days. Uh, and that in and of itself led Luciano to kill Dutch Schultz. Two days later, Schultz gets whacked coming out of a bar in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, Luciano effectively responded to that. Uh, business would continue as Luciano began to control the waterfoot, waterfront in Brooklyn, and he would begin to move into prostitution. In 1933, Herbert uh, Lehman, who was the governor at the time, appointed Thomas Dewey to the U.S. attorney position and told him to start going after organized crime. Uh, Dewey's assistant district attorney, Eunice Carter, sort of begins to look into a, a prostitution ring that runs through New York and New Jersey that ultimately leads to Lucky Luciano. Uh, Carter would trace the money flowing into New York and New Jersey. It would begin to build a case based on informants, wiretaps, and interviews with... Ladies of the night. <laughs> and February 2nd of 1936, Dewey gave the go-ahead for Carter to raid some 200 brothels based in Brooklyn and Manhattan. The move gave Dewey the reputation sort of as a gangbuster and a no-nonsense attorney. Uh, they were worried about corruption and didn't want any of the tip didn't want any tip-offs getting back to the mob. So she what she does is she assigns 160 police officers outside outside of the vice squad to conduct the raids, and the officers were instructed to wait on corners until they received their orders minutes before the raids were to take place. Ten men, a hundred women were arrested. However, unlike previous vice raids, uh, the arrestees were not released but taken to court where judge set bails of $10,000 far beyond the means in pay uh, that these people could afford. Carter had built trust with a number of the arrested ladies of the night uh, and madams, uh, some of who import, reported being beaten and abused by the mafia. She con she convinced many of them to testify rather than serve additional jail time. By mid-March, several defendants had implicated Lucky Luciano. Three of these whores implicated Luciano as the ringleader who made collections. Luciano associate David Patillo was in charge of the prostitution ring in New York, and the money that Luciano received uh, was from Patillo. And... Late March, I think, 1936, 
Uh, Luciano received a tip that he was going to be arrested, and he ends up fleeing to Hot Springs, Arkansas. Unfortunately for him, the New York detective in Hot Springs, on a different assignment, actually spots him and notifies Dewey. On April 3rd, Luciano would be arrested in Hot Springs on a criminal warrant from New York. The next day in New York, Dewey indicted Luciano and his accomplices on 60 counts of compulsory prostitution. Uh, Luciano's lawyers, lawyers in Arkansas then began a fierce uh, legal battle for extradition. On April 6, someone offered $50,000 bribe to Arkansas State Attorney General Carl E. Bailey to facilitate Luciano's case. However, Bailey refused and the bribe immediate, and, and immediately reported that someone tried to bribe him. Then, on April 17th, after all of Luciano's legal options had pretty much been thrown out, uh, Arkansas authorities handed him over to three NYPD detectives for transport by train back to New York for trial. When the train reached St. Louis, Missouri, the detectives and Luciano changed trains. During the switchover, they were guarded by 20 local policemen uh, to prevent a mob rescue attempt. The men arrived in New York City on April 18th, and Luciano was sent to jail without bail. On May 13th of 36, Luciano's pandering trial began. Dewey prosecuted the case that Carter built against Luciano. He accused Luciano of being part of the massive prostitution ring known as the Combination. During the trial, Dewey exposed Luciano for lying on the witness stand through direct quizzing and records of telephone calls, which Luciano had no explanation for uh, and had no explanation as to why his federal income tax records claimed he only made $22,000 a year when he was obviously a wealthy man. Dewey ruthlessly pressed Luciano his long arrest record in relationships with well-known gangsters such as Ciro Terranova, Joe Masseria, and Louis Lepke Bookhalter. On June 7th, Luciano gets convicted on 62 counts of prostitution. Then on July 18th, he was sentenced to 30 to 50 years in state prison along with Patello and a dozen others. Uh, many people have claimed and often asked if there was enough inf information and evidence to support the charge against Lucky Luciano. Uh, like nearly all the crime families, Luciano almost certainly profited from prostitution and extorted money from madams and brothel keepers. However, like a lot of other bosses, Luciano create, created layers of insulation between himself and his criminal acts, so it's very hard for me to personally believe that he was in the day-to-day -day operations of that business. So Luciano is sitting in prison. He continues, continues to try to run his family from prison, uh, giving orders through Vito Genovese. But in 1937, Genovese ends up fleeing to Italy, running away from a murder charge. In his absence, Luciano elevates Frank Costello as boss. Luciano would continue to file appeals, but nothing seemed to be working until World War II. Uh, one of the things that the government was worried about at the time, specifically the, the U.S. Navy, was that Nazis coming ashore uh, in the United States, and they really worried about the ports and the ships in New York City to begin with. Uh, the military and the government who ran those yards knew that they needed them to be protected, and what they did was they went to Meyer Lansky for help, and he in turn said, uh, go speak to Lucky Luciano, and maybe there could be a deal worked out given the right parameters. Uh, what the military government essentially, essentially asked for was protection of the ports. Luciano offered protection of the ports and offered them Sicilian mob contacts in Sicily uh, prior to the invasion of Sicily. The operation was officially called Operation Underworld. In return for his help, uh, Luciano's sentence would be commuted. In 1946, as the war was over, Thomas Duty, Duty, he is a duty, isn't he? Uh, <laughs> Thomas Dewey honored the the commission, uh, or he, he honored basically uh, what they said before. They would commute the Luciano sentence, and that's exactly what they did. But on the other side of that, what Dewey actually says to him is, well, we'll commute your sentence, but you're going back to Italy. You can't stay here. Uh, Luciano was furious with it, but he didn't argue about it. He just sort of accepted it, went with it, figuring, I'll figure out a way. On February 10th of 46, Luciano gets deported. In October of 1946, Lucky Luciano secretly moved to Havana, Cuba. He moved to Havana to be closer to the United States, to keep control of the mafia, and to work on a plan to try to get back into the United States. Lansky had already been going back and forth to Cuba, and he was investing in gambling joints. Uh, Luciano had business to discuss, and what he does is he calls Lansky and he says, I want to have a meeting. And I've talked about the Havana Conference a million times, so I don't want to get too much into it, but for the sake of it, I'll cover a little bit of it. And at this meeting. They were going to talk about the narcotics trade, gambling, 
uh, in Bugsy Siegel and Las Vegas. At the meeting, they discussed the failure of the Flamingo Hotel, where basically Lansky asked Luciano to give Lucky Lu- give Benny Siegel one more time. Luciano said, fuck this shit, he's got to die, and that's the end of it, and that's pretty much the way that went. Uh, they discussed the narcotics trade, the routes, how it would come from Sicily to Afghanistan to Corsica, etc., uh, and his whole point to the drugs was we can do it, but I don't want any bosses of families touching it because it, 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 it's let's let the Sicilians bring it in. We'll give them kickbacks on our rackets and et cetera. But I don't want any American mob bosses touching this shit. Uh, it just brought too much time. Uh, and so uh, something else that was discussed, and, and this was discussed privately and not in front of everybody else, was the issue with Vito Genovese. Uh, Genovese had actually come back from exile and he expected to take over the underboss role. Uh, and since Luciano was out of the country, Genovese pretty much thought he should be the actual boss in and of itself. <coughs> he suggested to Luciano that he should retire and just enjoy his money. Uh, Genovese secretly wanted Luciano go, gone, completely uh, done with the mob. Uh, Luciano wasn't going to accept his smart fucking mouth, and he ends up beating the living shit out of Genovese. The beating was so bad that Genovese couldn't leave his hotel for three days, but... This is what Genovese does. Genovese picks up the phone and he calls the government and he rats Luciano out, telling them that Lucky Luciano is now living in Cuba. Uh, It's a rat fucking move. It's a rat fucking move that makes you a fucking rat. Uh, And what ends up happening is the U.S. finds out they're furious because they don't want him anywhere near fucking United States. They want him in Italy where he belongs. Uh, And the other thing is the U.S. starts to put pressure on Cuba, telling them that you know, the, the medications and the medical supplies that you guys need from us, we're not going to give you unless you get rid of Luciano. And, and within a couple of days, Cuba bows and they throw Luciano the fuck out of Cuba. Uh, Luciano would end up going back to Italy and he would be arrested several different times for a bunch of different things. But one of the things Luciano did was he recognized that narcotics was really going to be his thing. So he, he sort of, and it always was his thing. So he embeds himself with guys like, uh, well, I don't want to get into names, but he beds himself with serious Sicilian narcotics traffickers, and that was going to be the big business that Luciano was going to stick to at that point. Um, so, like I said, he got close to Sicilian traffickers, uh, and they locked down the routes, and they start really importing shit. Then in 1957, Vito Genovese loses his fucking mind. Uh, Genovese, like we said earlier, wanted Luciano out. He wanted Costello out, and he knew that if he removed Costello then he could essentially take over, but he needed the support and help of others. So he ends up going to Carlo Gambino with an idea. He says, listen, you and Anastasia are pretty much the same age. You're never going to take over the Anastasia's crime family. Uh, so here's what I pr- uh, propose. I'm going to whack Albert Anastasia, uh, and then you'll take over the Gambino crime family. Uh, and then in return... I want you to turn a blind eye to what I'm about to do, and I'm going to kill Frank Costello. Uh, And then Genovese would end up taking over uh, Luciano's crime family, renaming it the Genovese crime family. That's exactly how it ends up going down. And Gambino goes along with it, even though he doesn't trust Genovese for any reason, because Gambino, the ends justified the means in this particular case. Uh, so Anastasia gets hit in 57 at the Park Sheridan Hotel Barbershop. Vincent Gigante would botch the hit on Costello outside of his apartment, but it was enough for Costello to say, fuck this shit. Uh, and Luciano really at that point loses all control that he had over the mob. Uh, then Genovese ends up calling a meeting, which would become known as the Appalachian meeting. Uh, he wanted the bosses to recognize that Carlo Gambino was the new boss of the Gambino crime family, and he wanted them to recognize him as new boss, but he wanted to be recognized as the boss of bosses, which turned a lot of heads and pissed a lot of people off. Uh, obviously, we know what happened at Appalachian. The feds raided the whole fucking place, but the mob essentially blamed Vito Genovese for his ego and his stupidity and for that fucking meeting. Uh, there were a lot of things that were discussed at that meeting as well, including narcotics, uh, but they ultimately blamed Genovese for that bullshit, and that's a mistake that would come back to haunt Vito Genovese. Uh, Carlo Gambino, for instance, never liked Vito Genovese. He simply let it happen uh, because, like I said earlier, he he let Genovese do what he wanted to do because he had a back plan for all of that, Uh, and what the back plan was is that Gambino went over to Italy, met with Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello, and they worked out a plan to get rid of Vito Genovese. Uh, Stories vary. 
but I think what is the most realistic is that Luciano paid a drug dealer to implicate Genovese in narcotics trafficking. However, Genovese was actually trafficking narcotics, and Genovese actually goes, I believe it was in Texas or somewhere, I believe it was Texas, he goes there to, to, to physically see his shipment, and when he walks in, guess what happens? Here come the lights, here come the cops. So it's long been said that Luciano notified the government. Is that a rat move? Yes. That is a 100% certifiable fucking rat move. But it was retaliation for what Genovese did. So it was a rat move made by a rat move. But the thing is, in today's connotation, we use the word rat, right? These guys did this to each other. Uh, when John Gotti killed Paul, Paul Castellano, they all went, oh, how could he kill a boss? That's, he fucked the whole mob up that way. Well, Gambino, uh, Gambino did it. Uh, fucking Anastasia did it. Fucking Genovese did it. Luciano did it twice. So there's a hypocrisy when people make that argument. This is just what the time period dictated. Do I see it as a rat move? 100% I think it's a rat move. But it was different time period. And that's the way that they typically handled things in those days. All right. So all that being said, Genovese ends up getting uh, arrested and he gets convicted and sent to prison for 13 years and would die pissed off as a motherfucker at the world. Uh, he knew he got fucked. He knew he got set up. But karma sort of had a way of fixing people at that point. Believe me. Uh, so Lucky Luciano would continue to work in the narcotics trade, but he no longer really had any power. Uh, he ended up moving over in the mafia to more of a, a conciliatory role uh, with Genovese rotting in a cell. Carlo Gambino essentially becomes the most powerful mob boss in the world. Uh, Luciano would uh, end up uh, suffering a massive heart attack uh, in the airport in Naples, and some have claimed he was murdered, but that's not the case. He was actually there to conduct a meeting about a film on his life, and that sort of gives credence to these people that have conspiracy theories. Uh, but I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, because ultimately he was going to get arrested right after that meeting anyway because they had filed drug smuggling charges against him and, and he would have gone away for the rest of his life after that anyway with the amount of evidence that they likely had. Uh, so like I said, he ends up dying in the airport. Uh, they end up flying him back to New York and he's buried over in St. John Cemetery in Queens. Uh, and and that, that's sort of the, the small version, the small version of Lucky Luciano, and I, I could have gone on for six hours and, and covered, you know, the Castamolari more uh, in depth, but I think I try to just give people the facts and just put it out there of A, B, C, D, and E, because I think that that sometimes is easier to digest. Uh, so here's a couple of things. Was Lucky Luciano a rat in the sense that he testified against somebody else to not do time? Uh, there is another instance that is out there that people are saying that, that, that he did he told cops stuff to get off of a couple of charges. There's a lot of rumors like that. But the only thing that is certifiable is that someone tipped off the government to Vito Genovese going there to check on his drug shipment. So who would have known that? Well, a lot of different people, right? And the argument that people might, might make to me is, well, it probably came from the inside, somebody in his own family. I don't think so, because who stood to gain the most out of that? Carlo Gambino really is the one that stood to make the most of that. Uh, but I think ultimately, at the end of the day, Gambino was loyal to Luciano and Costello, and he worked with them to try to get Genovese off the streets. But if we go back, Genovese is also the one that picked up the phone and called and told the authorities that Lucky Luciano was in Cuba. So we can argue the rat move back and forth. Those times were different, and I make that argument. Times were different. This is sort of the way they handled things. Uh, it's not the, the, the phrase rat in those days compared to today is a little bit different. Was Joe Valachi a rat? 100% what he did. Uh, but I just think that history will look, always looks back on Lucky Luciano being the godfather of the mafia, and he was. Uh, he started the commission. Uh, he reorganized and restructured a little bit. And he really brought the, brought the mafia into what it's become. Uh, even today, some of the things that, that are done are done as a result of that's what Lucky Luciano wanted. And that's what he sort of invented. Uh, and, and so, you know, he didn't, in, he didn't invent the five families. That's a big mis, misnomer that people get wrong. Uh, that was actually a, a, a uh, Maranzano thing. Uh, but as far as Luciano was a gangster, straight gangster, straight businessman, 
probably the most prolific gangster to ever have lived. I would put him, I, and I, for the life of me, I don't understand why Al Capone gets all these accolades uh, when, in comparison to Lucky Luciano. Luciano was the face of the mafia, should be the face of the mafia. Uh, he just was that smart and that good. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with the way he handled putting Vito Genovese away because you should have just killed the motherfucker. Why didn't you just kill him? Killing him would have been a hell of a lot fucking easier than doing it the way you did it. But Costello had something to gain because Genovese tried to kill him in an unsanctioned hit. So I, I'm curious as to why they didn't kill Genovese. I, I think that that's, that seems to be a question that I get from a lot of people is, why did they go the rat route? Why didn't they just fucking kill him? To me, killing him would have been a lot easier, probably a lot safer. But there's a reason why they didn't, and I'm not sure what that was. I, I don't think it was necessarily fear. I think they might have been worried that Joe Bonanno would rise up a little bit. Uh, I think they were afraid that other families would get involved in it a bit. But, you know, history always repeats itself. It always has, and it always will. Uh, but I think history, looking back on Lucky Luciano, is, is the father of the mafia. Uh, he got rid of a lot of old world ideals and values and said, fuck this shit. We need an upgrade. We need an update. And, and so what you see today, even in street gangs, uh, black street gangs, you know, the way that they organize themselves, they're not organizing themselves based on the mafia. Well, well, it is based on the mafia, but they're organizing themselves after Lucky Luciano because that's what he did. His structure, the way he did things is repeated today. You look at the best businesses, the Fortune 500 companies that are run today. They're run like the mafia because the system works. You look at fucking Amway and that big fucking pyramid scheme that that shithole fucking thing is. Same thing. Lucky Luciano was the innovator of a lot of fucking things, you know, so I think history will look back kindly on him uh, more so than, 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 than other people. And so when, when people come to me and, and try to levy some idea that Lucky Luciano wasn't a tough guy, he was. He absolutely was in the things that he was able to accomplish. Uh, if he doesn't do what he does, I don't know if the mafia is the same today. I really don't. I, I, there's a part of me that wishes that... that uh, that the, the Genovese crime family was still called the Luciano crime family is sort of an homage or a respect. That fat fuck Joey Messino goes, hey, I want to call, call the Bananos the Messino crime family. Fuck off, you rat. But no, I, I think that they, they should have kept Luciano crime family. I, I, that just I, as a respect thing. But you know what? It is what it is. Uh, and that's that. All right. So for future reference, uh, any, uh, everybody knows I, I talk about the Flanagans. Uh, if you want to check out what's going on with the Flanagans, uh, go to Facebook, Flanagans TV Show. Type that in. It'll come up. Check us out, Mob Talk Radio. Give us a like, a subscribe, or a threat. We get those too. Check us out on Twitter, at Real Mob Talk 7. You can send in your questions there. Shoot the shit with me, whatever you want to do. Uh, and you can check us out on Instagram. Just type in Mob Talk Radio. Once again, as always, I need to say this. Thank you to everyone who is donating. Uh, people have been donating two dollars here three dollars here a dollar here every little bit counts and i'm trying to keep this free we've been talking about a a new updated website and some other things like that and i'm waiting till the flanagan's is at least the pilot's done to start working on the new website and everything like that but that's where the money's going because if i don't do it then i gotta charge uh this stuff gets a little expensive with the upgrades and stuff like that so like i said i'm not holding a fucking gun to your head like a gangster but a dollar here a dollar there it all adds up to enable me to keep this free and just keep doing what we're doing and it also enables me to travel to go interview some people like i want to do in chicago some big stuff there uh and some stuff maybe in scranton pennsylvania some people i know there some people in rhode island so there's a lot of stuff moving on and going on somebody down in florida uh some really good interviews that i'm that i'm putting together very slowly but like i said airfare costs a lot right so i have to just kind of build up the piggy bank a little bit so i can do these things also we're going to start doing live shows uh that will come after the flanagan's uh comes out we will start doing live shows where you can watch the show not just listen but you can watch the show. So we're going to try to do that. And we got a couple of little documentary things we're going to do uh, that I think everybody's going to enjoy. So all that being said, we will see everybody next week with an all new topic. Q&A will be announced probably Friday. I'll put it out there, Q&A and go. Or uh, Thursday, Q&A and go and just submit your questions there. If I didn't get to your questions, I apologize. But please, everybody, keep donating if you can. 
Uh, I really appreciate it. I, and I try to email back everybody individually that does that. Uh, nobody's given me a thousand dollars, nothing like that. It's 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 peanuts. It's quarters on the quarters on the dollar, uh, and, and stuff like that. But I appreciate everybody who keeps doing that, and I appreciate everybody that is supporting the Flanagans. Uh, it's going to be a great show, and and the reason why I don't mention that today. Uh, is because uh, we're we're gonna try to be a little more quiet, but but I think it's safe to say uh, we're gonna have a uh, I think we're gonna do a premiere down in South Philly with my friends in South Philly, and we're gonna do something up here in New York for that. Uh, we are scheduled to start production September 28th, which is a Saturday, uh, and so that's that. So all that being said, uh, as we have more to announce, we definitely will. But once again, thank you to everybody who supports the channel and supports what I do. Without you guys, I couldn't do it. Have a great weekend.